the noise that came off and when you came on stage was was pretty frightening. <laughs> just like screaming girls. I'd go on like hunch going, fuck off. <laughs> This room, which is, which is where I took the phone call from you last September. You could have phoned me out of the blue and asked me to have a listen to these um, Hong Kong sessions that you recorded. I remember kind of taking the phone call, I had to step outside because I was in here with another <laughs> artist. And I thought, I better, this is quite a serious phone call. So I was just bursting with, with, with happiness inside, but I had to kind of get back and focus on what I was doing in here. I was so happy because I'd only just had that meeting with Damon. Then I went across to the management and <clears throat> we went into their secret glass room where no one can hear you say anything. Right to make this secret phone call to you. Yeah, yeah. And then obviously we had that thing like, well, we're, we're working on it, but we can't tell anyone. <laughs> well, I mean, that yeah, was amazing, yeah. wasn't it? We had to keep it quiet for so Because it's long. weird, because even like friends of mine, I, I couldn't even tell them. I and mean, I'd go home at night and Pepper would be like, where have you been? You're always late home for tea or whatever. <laughs> like, been at work. <laughs> and then when Alex came here to do some yeah. bass lines, then we got really nervous because yeah. it was like, oh, they're going to know something's up because Something, there's... Yeah. Two members of Blur knocking about. We're all on the same page. We all knew how important it was to kind of keep it so that it could just suddenly come out of nowhere. Even when Damon knew, he, he managed to keep it quiet, which is rare, <laughs> isn't it? Because he, like, he, he gets excited and he just yeah. flipping tells everyone. I always remember one of the, the first tracks that really stuck out in my mind, thinking this is really, really cool, was what became Go Out. Right, yeah. And, you know, it just struck me straight away that there was something about it that was... It was kind of visceral and primal. It's got and a I remember, Again, it's quite long, the jam, but it had, it had some good bit of the old guitar solo, which comes in. It was yeah. brilliant. It was just somewhere, way along somewhere else. So I thought, well, I'll get that and I'll put that there. And it still comes at the end of the song, but it yeah. came a bit earlier than it did on the original. On the original so that's a Hong Kong solo, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, that's great, that Definitely. solo. I mean, that is fantastic. That's how I was feeling in Hong yeah. Kong. Yeah, it was just great. It's quite an anxiety-inducing place. <laughs> Reminds me a little bit of your style on London Loves as well, your guitar solo on that. Yeah, yeah. It's one of those kind of more abstract ones. I like the sort of restraint and the tempo. Mm. You know, um, it, it's not hell for leather like Blur can get, no. but then it isn't. It isn't sort of sentimental at all. It's quite. It's quite a hard song. Because don't forget, you had done those two other singles like Under the West Way and, and, yeah. uh, and is it Full Stay, the other one? Yeah. Which were kind of quite more on the mellow end of, of the Blur scale. So I thought it was important this time for this record that whatever you put out was a little bit more, you know, uh, yeah, I, on, on, I on, the, so. on the uh, kind of hard edge of what you do. Because there, there was more obvious, more familiar territory that we could have gone with, I suppose, like, like Lonesome Street. Because Lonesome Street has got it's almost a history of Blur in one song, in it? It's got a sort of psychedelic bits, it's got a mid-tempo bits, it's got a bit of sort of storytelling, and it's got some crazy keyboards, and it's got a, a, a good old sort of knees up sort Coda of... Coda at the end. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so it's got a lot of Blur like devices of or whatever. I, like it because I think that's why we put it at the front of the album, isn't it? It's like, yeah. right, there you go. There's everything we can do in one song. Now, now sit down and enjoy the rest of the album. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah kind of, it's kind of yeah. cool. What do you got? The very first time I came across you guys was the first week of January of 1991 or something like that. Was it? 91? 92, yeah. wasn't it? Anyway, we went in and did that test session. Do you remember? It was a yeah, it was session. really exciting because, you know, you were the Smiths producer, you know, and I mean, I definitely was a massive Smiths fan. And we did our first session. We come together and yeah, there's another way. They were it? keeping a right close eye on things, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. And then I disappeared Smooth. for two months and I came back and there's no other way was out and it was a hit. Mm. Couldn't believe it. <laughs> yeah. And the, the next key meeting between you and me, I guess, would be that time when you'd made a start on what was going to be the second album. I bumped into you at that Cranberries gig, do you remember, in Soho? Oh, yeah. 
I was really gutted not to be involved on the second album, but you started it with Andy Partridge, if I remember rightly. Oh, that's, oh my God. Do you remember? Just, yeah, it's bringing back some weird memories. We were all unhappy. We didn't quite know what to do. It was getting into a bit of a, a situation where we were really you know, freaking out quite a lot about it, really. And so bumping into you just seemed like a good sign. And that must have just led, led on to you getting contacted again. That sort of time, the, the album we've just done, really reminds me of that sort of time creatively. Yeah, yeah. Even though we were under phenomenal pressure at that point from the record label to come up with a great record, I, I, I was quite unaware of that at the time, just how close we were to sort of being, being dropped, I think, actually. So um, he saved our bacon again. Well, don't forget with the two songs we added at the very end, Chemical World and uh, For Tomorrow, do you remember? Oh, what well, was that infamous, that infamous day when Balfi came in and basically washed his hands off the album, <laughs> which made Damon go away and write two more songs, which actually, in retrospect, it was, a, it was a good thing. Yeah, it was a good thing. But we were always doing that, getting summoned to Balfi's office, <laughs> and he'd shout so much, and his eyes would be bulging, he'd be, there'd be spit all over his <laughs> desk, and, and we'd be scared to death. <laughs> it's this, that age-old thing of us wanting to be kind of creatively just so, and him wanting hoots. And, you know, do you remember on There's No Other Way, I think, the two-note the two keyboard line? As soon as Balf heard that, he was like, that's the heat, <laughs> straight away, you know, just the two notes. I saw a parallel between what you were doing and what I saw exactly happen to the Smiths when I worked with them. Mm. There was that kind of thing, like, when you're on a wave and you just run with it, you know what I mean? There was no time to think. That was when it was getting kind of weird. The audience was getting younger and younger, and our kind of weirdo art school audience was mm. dwindling. Yeah, yeah. And it was starting to sort of change the front row, and that's just just loads of girls. The noise that came off when you came on stage was, was pretty frightening. <laughs> it was like screaming, and I used to... <laughs> You know, it's the sort of thing that Alex sort of, you know, stood there and absorbed, and I'd go on like hunch, going "fuck off," <laughs> and get my guitar on, you know, and put your army, uh, put me army hat, hat on, on and, and then put the distortion pedals on as, as loud as I could go, and and just trying to scare them away, try and scare them. <laughs> but that's just showing what Blur kind of was, really. Yeah. It's this weird balance between me who wanted to be. Pete Townsend, and then there was Alex who wanted to be John Taylor or, or something. <laughs> Do you remember that time just after the Great Escape then when the wheels were put in motion to get started on what would become the Blur record, the fifth one? Mm. Do you remember me coming around to see you, have a chat with you because there was a really? lot of tension between you and and uh, Alex, I think, at the time, or Damon. Oh, was it Alex? I remember coming around to see you. It was you. just tension like, oh. with me, really. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's funny considering how mellow our relationships are now and, and how accepting we are of each other that we did. We did used to fight quite a lot, really, back then. At that point, I was kind of championing a lot of female bands and female musicians and other punk rock stuff like that. And him being a contrary bugger was doing his best to be opposite that, really. But then so, that um, tension led to us making this probably, well, what I think it was probably the you know, one of the best records we did work on together, yeah. the Blur record. Well, I, I remember on that, making that record, I brought in some of these American groups that I liked. I think I brought in a Tortoise album, and I brought in um, Slanted and Enchanted. Pavement. By yeah. Pavement. Really. Put that on straight, you ever listen to that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Alex was like, shit, or something like that, you know. <laughs> he did the same thing the other day in rehearsals. I was like, want to try this big Telecaster bass, maybe for, for Go Out, it might, it might have that big sort of honk. Yeah. And so he got it, it took flipping half an hour to go to the lock-up to get this, and he plays it, he's going, you shit.